This is not actually a, an unusual thing at all. You can imagine that this is this this when this right brain comes online and gives rev revelationary information, almost like the way a dream does to people that is actually functional and useful. They they would very very quickly think of it like back in the past before we perhaps knew all the science. They would think of it like a, a voice, a, a vision, a, a description coming from God. God is speaking to us and guiding us. God is speaking to me and guiding me. Muhammad was spoken to by Allah, and Allah guided him to create the Quran. And, and he, he, when Muhammad was um, doing works in the world and he came into a crisis, he would spend time with his mind and he'd have another revelation. This part of his mind, he was probably really connected to it. He had the, the vessel towards the, 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 the world open. And it's a very, very interesting idea. Why do you think that perhaps... <laughs> Yes, I'm going to lose it. Sam Harris is going to unfollow me on Twitter now but perhaps at the center of reality is some type of intelligent force ordering everything like the way there's an order in music and your right brain can get possessed by it and you can talk its will to yourself and maybe other people around you it could happen you don't really know the Christians understood this as the Holy Spirit. When you had these moments of frenzy and revelation, it was the Holy Spirit. When you got possessed by something, it was, well, hopefully the Holy Spirit, the better part. When the right general came into your mind, it was the Holy Spirit that was talking. But the bad general was the temp tempting demon or Satan at the bottom of it. For example, after Jesus died, St. Stephen, namesake, the eponymous champion here, St. Stephen, he was scared because he was a follower of Christ, but everybody who followed Jesus was getting the crap kicked out of them. They were getting killed. And he was worried because the, the, the Jews in, in Palestine at the time were killing the, the, the Jesus following Jews. And so they're like, Woof, don't be following there, don't be following Jesus there, you mad you madman. But St. Stephen did. And what happened is they decided to stone him. And at, uh, during his trial, he was nervous and he was told to trust that the Holy Ghost would come to him at the right moment. And while he was in court, suddenly he was possessed by this frenzied thing and this emotion ripped up out of him and spoke through him and condemned them all. An awful lot like what happened to Socrates. He just called them all out. He ripped them a new one. And he said, you're all fakes. You're all liars talking about your Messiah. He came and you killed him. And now you're going to kill all of us for believing that too. And that's a fascinating thing because it's like w w what's happening there because this man was w probably one of the first martyrs in history the first spiritual beings first men possessed by the holy spirit and confronting the 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 the, the power sticking sticking it to the power the first anarchist the first revolutionary now that's a fascinating thing because again it's he allowed himself to get possessed by a general and he allowed it probably to take over and speak through him that was the language he allowed the whatever came into his right brain at that moment, the signal was coming from somewhere else, and it moved him to say stuff that was very, very relevant. And strangely, he became a one of the most important per people in all of history. And there's this sort of sense that continues through Christianity that this Holy Spirit appears in history all the time through our right brain, like a dream, and guides many really important people towards certain ends that almost collectively seem to be like steering history somewhere. That's a weird thought. For example, Jesus himself spent quite a lot of time talking to God, if you read through the Bible. John, he's constantly talking about the Holy Spirit. He even says that so much is that you can deny me, but don't deny the Holy Spirit. That's some very interesting stuff. Now, I'm not sure if that's necessarily what he says. I'm gonna get, the Christians are gonna beat the crap out of me. I'll have, have Sam Harris on one side pulling my arm off, the Christians on the other, but it's along those lines anyway. And this constantly shows up. It just shows up uh, quite a lot. Isaiah had his visions. Nietzsche and Zarathustra, very, very famous, where this vision for this, this, this wise old man character jutted into his mind and started to speak for him in response to the get death of God. Jung goes through a massive psychotic break where this, this spirit he calls his anima comes and guides him into his unconscious which underneath has more of these generals various generals he can interact with the forces in underneath his mind martin luther the man who did the protestant reformation he refused to deny his conscience in the face of the church in the face of the courts and that's why the reformation happened napoleon was guided by a diamond a demon, uh, a voice in his mind, a, a spirit in his mind, a Holy Spirit perhaps. And when he stopped listening to it, that's when he began to start losing. 
Descartes, the man who came up with this conception of the, the, the mind-body dualism, as we say, the people kind of took in the wrong direction. He was the man who sort of set the paradigm for the scientific mind. And Descartes had the idea to do this, to, to go with this sort of very rational, left-brained attitude towards the world after he was visited by an angel. And the angel said to him, nature shall be conquered through the use of number and measure. Now, all of this stuff is absolutely fascinating because you can see how these revelationary experiences tilt history. They tilt thinking. They tilt people's lives. They're big deals. Jung said that his experience with the Red Book was as significant, the, probably the most significant thing that ever happened to him and became the foundation from which he understood all the rest of his life and came up with all of his, all of his theories. And so on some level, you have to attribute what happened, like the value contained in Jung's work, to this revelationary experience at this critical period during 1913 and 1918. These are essential things to understand, and they're not easy to dismiss. Nietzsche had the same approach towards his Zarathustra, as he said. He felt Zarathustra was something that came to him and gave him something impeccably valuable that he could now offer to the world. And he was immensely proud of what he had achieved there. And it was something that he felt that the rest of his life he spent writing Beyond Good and Evil, Genealogy, Morals, all that stuff. That was just sort of explaining iterations on what Zarathustra might have mean. He saw Zarathustra as a flash of truth. And so this Holy Spirit enters into us, this um, force enters into us and seems to like niggle and naggle history in certain directions and people like Nostradamus they have this strange thing where they have these frenzies and they get presented with information that they take to so certain conclusions that suggest very interesting things.